Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits. I have a tour through the second volume of Weldon's Practical Needlework, published in 1887. And I'll take a look at the relationship between the heels of 16th century woven hose and knitted stockings. So let's get started. This first tidbit showed up in my email box, but it was also forwarded to me by Ms. Thimble. It's an announcement about the Knitting History Forum, which is an all-day online conference, and it'll be held on Saturday, the 28th of January, from 11.15 a.m. until 4.45 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. So that means if you live here in North America, that start time is 6.15 a.m. on the East Coast, 5.15 a.m. here in the Central Time, and 3.15 a.m. on the West Coast. I have attended this online um, conference in the past, and it's really interesting. There are going to be a lot of great speakers and topics this year, including, and I'm going to get some of these names wrong, Christy Yesti from Estonia on the heritage of Estonian mittens, Cynthia Lecount Samaki Samak on developments in traditional Andean knitting and Chulu designs. Frankie Owens on the practice of Peruvian knitting, and Helena Magnuson on Icelandic knitting traditions, and Irene Wagoner on knitting in Morocco's High Atlas region. The cost for the uh, conference is 25 British pounds. There used to be a membership fee to belong to the History Forum, but they've recently switched so that there that membership is free and then there's a charge instead uh, if you want to attend the conference. If you are interested in joining the Knitting History Forum, there is uh, also information about that on their website. I will leave links down below to their website. This is the first of several art-related tidbits this week. This came to me from Cielo Vista on Ravelry. It's a link to a piece of art on a site called Post. The description of the artwork is as follows. This drawing is by Anya Rosen, a 13-year-old primary school student in Slovenia. And she is the winner of the international Plaket Meru competition. I'll put the name of that competition on the screen. Anya was chosen from 600,000 children from around the world. And uh, the way she describes her work is, my drawing represents the land that connects us and unites us. Humans are knit together. If one gives up, the others fall. We are all connected to our planet and to each other, but unfortunately we have little knowledge of it. We are intertwined together. Others weave beside me my own story and I weave theirs. I'll leave a link below so that you can look at this amazing image at your leisure. This is another art-related tidbit mixed with some knitting technology. This came to me from Cindy on Ravelry. It's an article about an Australian woman named Sarah Spencer who hacked a 1980s era knitting machine and turned it into a network printer. So an image is sent to the knitting machine from a computer over a network and then the machine prints out multicolored knitted fabric. So her knitted map of the known universe is the star example of her hack, and that map is now on display at the Victoria State Library in Australia. The article that I'm going to link to down in the show notes includes several photographs of her work, but it also has an embedded video uh, where she gives a 30-minute talk about the technology and about her, her hack of the knitting machine. This next art-related tidbit was also sent to me by Cindy. It's a painting called Winding the Skein by Lord Frederick Layton. 
painted in about 1878. I'll leave a link to the image down in the show notes. The text associated with the painting says that Leighton's pristine vision of the antique world is set on a terrace overlooking the Bay of Lindos, a view studied by the artist on his visit to the island of Rhodes in 1867. There is a contrast between the humble domesticity of the task and the heroic classicism of its presentation. In 1878, Henry James described the picture as, quote, quite the most strictly beautiful, indeed, I think the only very beautiful work in the Academy. So the Academy that Henry James was referring to is the Royal Academy of Art, which ran a school of instruction, but also had major exhibitions a couple of times a year. I'll leave a link to the painting down in the show notes, as well as to a website that explains more about what this Royal Academy was. I've mentioned the Coast Salish Knitters a couple of times in the past few weeks. They are the indigenous people of the Pacific Northwest who knit the Cowichan sweaters. Aria sent me a link to an article pertaining to the Coast Salish textile traditions, uh, which I will link down in the show notes. The link that she sent is to a magazine article called The Dogs That Grew Wool and the People Who Love Them. Uh, the article is about a small breed of domesticated dog that were kept by the Coast Salish people until wool sheep were brought to the area by European colonists. These dogs were small, but they didn't shed, and so they were shorn each year, and then their wool was combined with goat's wool and goose down to produce yarn. It was then woven into rugs. Dog hair doesn't have the same sort of qualities that sheep's wool has that allows it to be easily spun. So the dog hair had to be blended with other animal fibers in order to be turned into yarn. But after the European colonists arrived with domesticated sheep, the fiber from wool dogs became less important and the, the dogs really don't survive today. Um, but the article that I will be linking to talks about the sort of legends that were surrounding those wool dogs and the doubts that people had about whether or not the woven rugs ever really actually included the dog wool, and then the subsequent research that proves that they did. It's really interesting, and if you prefer listening to um, something like this, there's an audio version of the article uh, that you can listen to instead, which is about 25, 26 minutes long. This final tidbit is a video that came up in my YouTube recommendations, and then at least four or five people sent me the link as well. The video was filmed at the American Revolution Museum at Yorktown, which is an 18th century reenactment re museum. And the woman in the video is demonstrating knitting and talking about the types of items that people during that time period would have knitted, particularly on double pointed needles. And the, the things that they would have used in their daily lives. I found it to be really um, interesting and the video description includes links to patterns for some of the items shown in the video such as a petticoat for a baby which is really sort of a sleeveless wool underdress as well as fingerless gloves with these nice long arms uh, for a woman. The items were all knit with hand spun yarn, which is pretty cool. And the video is about 17 minutes long. So I wasn't sure if I should bring this up, but I did think uh, I would mention it and then give an explanation. So because I think some of you might notice this as well and wonder, you know, what's going on with that. So when the woman doing the demonstrations was holding up the items that she had knit with her beautiful hand spun yarn, I noticed that the, the circular fabric was kind of biasing as it went up the tubes, um, which can happen if you, when you knit in the round, but usually washing and blocking will straighten that out. Then I saw a close up of the knitted uh, glove, which is a really cool glove. And I noticed that the stitches were twisted. I thought, well, that's, that's interesting. It's un it seems like it would be unusual uh, at that time in that location in North America to work the knitted fabric in twisted stitches. 
It's absolutely a knitting style that is um, used in Eastern cross knitting. So it's a legitimate technique. I was just surprised to see that in something from that time period in North America. So I followed the links to the patterns that were down in their video description. And I saw that the original patterns that she was knitting from did not have twisted stitches. So I think it's just her own personal knitting is that way. She mentioned that she was left-handed and which means she's probably a mirrored knitter. She may also be what's uh, called a combined knitter. So if she's knitting flat, she may not notice that sort of thing. Um, but this is something that can happen regardless of whether you're a mirror knitter or a standard knitter. You can end up with sometimes your fabric is twisted. So I have done a video on this, this unintentionally twisted stitches. Um, so if you are wanting to understand more about what I'm talking about, you can look at the, the fabric that uh, she's showing that she has knit in her video. And then I will also link to my video on unintentionally twisted stitches. So again, I wasn't sure I should bring this up, but I did think that some of you might notice it. I just, I want to explain it. I'm not criticizing her. It's just, it's an observation that I was making and I just wanted to understand really what was going on in her knitting versus uh, what maybe had been the original pattern. A few weeks ago, I bought uh, a 12 volume set of Weldon's Practical Needlework that were published as facsimile copies by Piecework Magazine back in, I think it was the early 2000s. Um, so I showed you guys volume one last week, uh, which were the issues published in 1886. So this week, I thought I'd show you volume two, which was published in 1887. So let's go to the overhead and let's take a look. So this is volume two of Weldon's Practical Needlework. So volume two would have been all of the issues that were published uh, one per month in 1887. One of the things I think is interesting about volume two is that rather than having say four issues that focused on knitting, uh, two that focused on stocking knitting, a couple that focused on crochet and then maybe a little bit of macrame knit, um, lace, that kind of thing. This volume, there was one issue per topic for, for the years. We have one issue of stocking knitting, one of cross stitch embroidery, cruel work, bizarre articles, um, and then we have knitting. So we'd still have stocking knitting, knitter and knitting, crochet, smocking, applique work, netting, macrame lace. And then we have crochet edgings and knitting edges. So there are three issues that do um, focus on knitting, but they're sort of a general knitting area, then edgings and then the, the stocking knitting. So this is the, um, the stocking knitter. This is, it says the third series. So the two issues that were in volume one in that first year, that was the first series and the second series. So if you go to the Piecework website and you want to buy uh, the digitized version of this practical stocking knitter, you'd get the one that has the third series. I think the third and fourth series, which must be in volume three, um, are packaged together in the digital download version. So we've got a child's uh, plain knit first sock. We've got a um, gentleman's bicycle stocking, a gentleman's stocking Berlin pattern, whatever that means. Berlin wool, was a type of wool that came in various thicknesses and were, was used for Berlin wool work, which was like a type of needlepoint, but it was also used for knitting. So I'm not sure if they're talking about the yarn or if they're talking about the stitch pattern itself. We've got some ribbed stocking, a lady's silk stocking ribbed in stripes. Gentleman's ribbed stocking, a striped sock for a boy of five. Gentleman's plain knit striped sock, knickerbocker stocking, um, which is kind of interesting. Child's fancy socks. They've got children's socks here. Fancy, different types. 
So these are not, these are engravings. So at this point in time, they didn't put photographs in these books, but they did have engravings. And a lot of times they're really detailed. If you look at them closely, you can see, you know, the knitted stitches. You can really see what the stitch pattern looks like. So I'm always impressed by how accurate these engravings are. So that's the end of the stocking knitter and then you get into cross stitch and embroidery and crewel work and, and things like that. Um, then this is the practical knitter and this again is the fifth series. They had four series in that first volume. So we have a little um, baby's open knit Spencer. And even though this is not stocking knitter, it's knitter, they have sock and stocking patterns typically in the issues that are devoted to uh, general knitting. Um, a petticoat. They really like these kneecaps. So they're, almost every knitting book from that era has a knitted kneecap. So again, more socks and stockings. This is a baby's boa. I'm not sure why a baby needs a boa and any parent who put what something like that on their child today would be told that they were as a choking hazard but this is the thing that i uh, find very amusing these are reins for children so these are the little armholes and this goes across their check their chest and then these are <laughs> like the little straps so they can't run off uh, if you're out somewhere in public so a lot of times people put backpacks on their kids or have leashes on their kids if you're at some place really crowded and your kid's a rambunctious toddler. But they had um, knitted reins for children even back then. We've got more stocking patterns and we've also got just some little stitch patterns that you might want to use for... Um, this one says this stitch is suitable for... Uh, Stripes for sofa pillows, etc., or made of cotton. It's very pretty for counterpanes, which are a type of uh, bed covering. Uh, more stockings. This looks like a combination shawl poncho type of thing. Again, more stockings. Another, um, this one's a knitted edging. Underwear and, and lace patterns. And then an insertion and border for a quilt. So then you get into the crochet, um, which I'm going to skip. I'm sorry if you're a crocheter and wanted to see that. Um, and so now we have practical knitter edging. So these are the kinds of edgings that they uh, people might have put um, sewn to like pillowcases, things like that. So edgings uh, for different things. I suppose you could also use them as cuffs. Like if you had a blouse or something and you wanted some edgings um, uh, for your cuffs, something like that. So they have quite a few different edging patterns. Some are quite similar to each other, but with slight variations. Uh, but, but really quite a few different uh, and, and again, you can really see a lot of the detail, uh, even though those are engravings and not uh, photographs. Um, but that is the knitting that you can find in this facsimile edition of Volume 2 of Weldon's Practical Needlework. So I just wanted to remind you that while Piecework doesn't sell these hard copy, facsimile copies anymore, they do still sell digital versions of the individual types of needlework. So knitting, crochet, um, stocking knitter, all of those series for sure that they sell those. Um, and I will leave links to their shop down in the show notes. Last week, I was talking about the distinction between socks and stockings, and also a little bit about the term hose. I was wondering if the term stocking came into use because of the introduction of knitted stockings as a replacement to woven hose. Um, so I had a plan um, to go back and, and reread Richard Rutt's History of Hand Knitting. Um, which I have not done yet, but I got a lot of recommendations from people in the comments 
uh, for other books that I might find useful. And so I've been like reading and, and taking in a lot of this information. I've got a used book on order. Somebody sent me a few pages from a book that's very difficult to get. Um, and so I really appreciate all of that information and trying to sort of decipher what was going on in the 16th century when it came to uh, hose and stockings and, and socks and that sort of thing. One of the things I realized <laughs> is um, that first of all, I made a claim early on, like a month or so ago, that I'm not going to actually knit any stockings, or certainly not any pairs of stockings as part of this project. Maybe I'll knit one stocking. I'm really more interested in what was going on in the heels and the toes and, and sort of the evolution of socks throughout the 20th century. But of course, the more I'm learning about things as I go back in time, the more interested I am. Um, also, it has been very cold here in the upper Midwest uh, this week. We have had temperatures well below zero Fahrenheit and real field temperatures in like minus 30 to minus 35 uh, Fahrenheit. But it's, once you get that cold, it's, it's almost the same in Celsius. It's really cold. We also were getting a lot of snow, which meant there was no sun. Usually when it's that cold, it's too dry for any sort of precipitation and so we get a lot of passive solar heat and that really helps um, us not be too cold in our houses but it was snowing and so it was cloudy and the cold was just seeping through the walls and my legs uh, my desk is right up against the out an outside wall and my legs were just freezing i had a blanket over and i thought maybe thigh high wool st stockings weren't such a bad idea uh, here in Minnesota uh, when it gets that cold. So I'm kind of rethinking that, the idea of uh, knitting a, a full pair of stockings. Uh, but the other thing that has got me really intrigued is how woven hose were constructed. And particularly in that period of time where people were wearing woven hose and knitted stockings, like, like that 16th century period where the aristocracy was like, hey, these, these knitted stockings, silk knitted stockings at a fine gauge are fantastic, but most of the people were still wearing uh, woven hose. And my understanding, you know, my understanding was that, oh, well, knitted stockings just kind of replicated woven hose, but I didn't really think about the connection, like the, cons the actual construction methods. Uh, and I've been thinking about it more since I knit that, that um, sock that I reverse engineered from that Norwegian sock that was knitted by a woman who was like born 100 years ago because this heel that she used is a type of heel that was really common in the 19th century, but it was almost uh, completely ubiquitous prior to the 19th century. Like this type of heel, that was what people used. I didn't really realize that. Um, and so I really started examining woven hose a little more and looked at like some patterns for them that, that are available on YouTube people who are reenactors or I made my own hose and kind of looking at how people are approaching um, that design. And I realized that the reason this common heel was so common is because it really did replicate the woven version. The heel itself replicated that. When I first saw this style of heel in Weldon's Practical Stocking Knitter, when I got a digitized copy like three, four years ago, and I saw the description of the common heel and also what they call the manufacturer's heel and other people would call the shaped common heel, which is what this heel is. It's just a plain rectangle and there's a little bit of, of decreasing toward the bottom of the heel. Um, and, and then what happens is that you have live stitches right here and live stitches right here. You just fold the heel in half and then you join this across. And in Weldon's, I believe they said just to bind it off and then sew it shut. 
but in a lot of 19th century patterns, what they tell you to do is to use a three needle bind off, which is less bulky than binding off and then sewing it shut. But it always struck me that that would be kind of uncomfortable. Why would anybody, why would this be a common heel? This is what my early thoughts were because, because you'd have that little ridge under here and that seems like it would be uncomfortable. But as I've gone back further and further in time and I've seen uh, what the stockings of the, or the hose, woven hose were that the original netted stockings were based on, I understood that this is, this is how fabric stockings were knit. So you'd have your, your hose would, the, for the leg would be one piece and there'd be a seam up the back and so you'd have two bits right here that you would have shaped and you would have a seam along the bottom. Well, then you would have all of these other sewn bits to the foot in order to get the shaping to work. So you would have seams in multiple places. So if when you instead are knitting a stocking and the only little bit of seaming you have is this part that's right under your heel, which is the thickest skin that you have on your entire foot, that had to have been such an improvement over all of these seams in other places. And so I could understand why it might take a couple of centuries to think, oh, well, you know what? We could maybe turn the corner in other ways. We wouldn't have to just do it this way. But I really do want to get a better understanding of how people were we're doing something like this with woven fabric. So one of the things I have learned is that for the leg where you have like the shaping around the leg is that they weren't, they weren't creating the stockings, you know, this way or this way. They were, they had the fabric on the bias because when it's on the bias, it's stretchier. So the leg for sure was done in the bias. And it sounds like perhaps the top of the foot was as well. And then the sole might have been not on the bias because you didn't want it that to shift and stretch around as much. So that is really intriguing to me. And I am looking as, at many sources as I can for how people are, are recreating these, but I'm also wanting to look at photographs of extant sock, stockings from that time period so I can see the different variations for how they were made. One of the things that's interesting about people who are doing these woven stockings, these reenactors, is that most of them, I haven't found any so far, who are also knitters. And so like, it's just like a mind bending problem for them, this idea of having to turn the corner, where if you're a sock knitter who's ever knit with a heel flap and gusset, it's just going to be, I think, a little bit more intuitive in terms of how the pieces go together. But I say that without having actually tried it myself. Um, but I, I think I would like to try that. I would like to try a, some woven hose and then also I will, I think at some point, make a full pair of stockings um, that I can wear here in Minnesota in the winter time when it's, the temperatures are so cold. I'm just so grateful for central heating. I can't tell you how grateful I am for central heating. If you have any interesting knitting tidbits you'd like to share, you can send me a DM on Ravelry or you can send me an email at RoxanneRichardsonKnits at gmail.com. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.